Hello there, welcome to another Classic Golf Clubs. Today I'm looking at a set of Dunlop Tony Jacklin blades. I'll also be looking at Tony's career from his early days through to his captaincy of the European Ryder Cup team. Before that, here are the time checks for this video should you wish to skip ahead and please press the like and subscribe and even leave a comment as it makes me think that people might be interested in the videos and I'll be encouraged to make more. Well let's have a look at the clubs then. Starting with the woods as usual and this section will be, will be very short because they're the same woods that I used in the first um, playing video that I did on course with 1970s blades I think it was called uh, the picture of Max Faulkner on the thumbnail. There they are Dunlop Max Fly or Max Flight should I say Max Flight and Max Fly weren't quite the same thing. The Max Flight was a bit of a budget, uh, or more of a budget club, whereas the Max Fly was generally used for Dunlop's better quality clubs. So there they are, we'll move on to the irons. And here are the irons then. Very nice set of Dunlop Tony Jacklin blades from 1970. These were modelled on the Dunlop Roberto Di Vincenzo blade that Tony Jacklin used to win the 1969 Open. I've got a picture of that uh, that I'll bring up which shows Tony Jacklin with that club and you can see the striking similarity between this model and the Roberto Di Vincenzo model with which he won the, the Open. I've got the full set of these 3 to 9 plus pitching wedge and sand wedge. Well, I've not got them all on the table here. I've just got 369 pitching wedge and sand wedge. And we can see straight away that uh, the 3 to 9 have got the same design, whereas the pitching wedge and the sand wedge uh, have got a slightly different uh, design. It's often the case with sand wedges that you'll have a different design, but this one includes it on the pitching wedge as well. Uh, we can see, uh, I've got a piece of card here when I'm talking about closer elements. So we can see there, very nice ferrule and the hosel on these, there we are, we can just about read Delafit patent and that was a patent that uh, Dunlop came up with whereby the hosel was uh, spot welded in effect onto the, uh, the shaft and it's a, a very difficult type of head to remove because of that the bane of many a professional's life when the, the shafts did need replacing and that has been done on the three iron we can see that straight away it's got a different ferrule on there and the step pattern on the shaft is different too so very nice clubs we'll have a look at the face and it's a frosted face on the lines with uh, uh, dots framing the face uh, as we can see there and the same on the five iron and um, all the clubs obviously so there we are i'll post the lofts on these a little bit later down the line but uh, that's the the irons that i'm going to be playing today finishing with the putter then this is a model produced by edinburgh golf which is a company i've not been able to find out a lot about apart from the fact that they were definitely operating in the mid-1970s through to late 1970s and during that time they produced quite a range of uh, irons and woods but beyond that I've not been able to find much at all so if anybody does know anything about Edinburgh Golf who were based obviously near Edinburgh at Duns in Berwickshire I'll be very happy to receive comments in the comments below so let's have a look at the putter as we can see it's a, a flanged blade style with a very large flange on the back there which gives it quite a nice bit of stability on the hosel we can see it says on the hosel we can see it says made in scotland it's got a nice ferrule black with two gold bands the shaft band also has the edinburgh golf logo the grip is a avon pro only model i'd guess that this is the original grip uh, it's quite uh, quite old anyway, so I'd say it dates to the, the time of the club, which as I say, I suspect is the 1970s. The model itself, if we have a look on the bottom, there we are, Edinburgh Golf logo again and the model Rapier. Very nice putter and as usual, I hope to be able to demonstrate that to good effect on the course. 
Coming back to Tony Jacklin then, I think it's easy to forget just how good a golfer he was and how big was his influence on British golf. Born in 1944 in Scunthorpe, the son of a lorry driver, Jacklin was an unlikely candidate for golfing glory. He first came to public attention when he achieved the first televised hole-in-one at the Dunlop Masters in 1967, which he went on to win. Tony Jacklin was one of a number of hungry and aspiring young golfers who appeared on the scene in the mid to late 1960s. Names like Peter Butler, Brian Huggett, Ronnie Shade, Peter Townsend, Dave Thomas and Brian Barnes. While they all enjoyed success, Jacqueline was the only one to make the breakthrough with a major victory. He was a determined and steely competitor with a strong drive for success and travelled to America in the late 1960s to gain invaluable experience. All of his hard work paid off at Lytham and St Anne's in 1969 when he won the Open by two strokes with a score of four under par. This was the first win by a Briton since Max Faulkner at Royal Port Rush in 1951. This win elevated the handsome young golfer to superstar status. I love this picture of Tony at rest in a typical 1960s housing estate with the claret jug casually placed on the table beside him next to the day's newspaper. The following year he achieved arguably even greater success when he became the first British golfer to win the US Open in over 40 years, winning by seven strokes with a score of seven under par. These two great successes put huge demand on Jacqueline from sponsors and his management company, IMG, made every effort to maximise the opportunities that came, so much so that Jacqueline believes with hindsight that he lost his competitive edge. His lack of form was made even worse at the 1972 Open by his loss to Lee Trevino from a position of strength in the closing holes, something Tony believes affected him mentally. Trevino chipped in five times during the four rounds, but the most crushing was on the final day at the par 5 17th hole. Both players were tied at six under par, Jacqueline on the green in three shots with a 15-foot birdie opportunity, Trevino in the rough over the back for four. But Trevino chipped in and Jacqueline, having watched him, then three-putted to drop one behind. He then bogeyed the 18th two and finished in third place. While Jacqueline never seriously threatened again in a major, he later found even greater glory as captain of the European Ryder Cup team from 1983 to 1989. Jacqueline instilled belief into the team and ensured that they were treated like stars rather than the second-rate feeling that had gone with previous teams. Jacqueline had been involved in the famous concession match in 1969, which resulted in a tie. But after that, America had dominated matches so much that interest in the Ryder Cup was waning. In 1979, Great Britain and Ireland became Europe in an attempt to bring some parity. But the first two matches, captained by John Jacobs, were just as one-sided as before. In 1983, however, after flying to the US on Concord with the charismatic Seve in the team, along with world-class players like Faldo, Langer, Lyle and Woosnam, a new confidence was there and they almost pulled off a shock result, losing by 14.5 to 13.5. In 1985 at the Belfry, this newfound spirit showed itself to the full in a 16.5 to 11.5 win for Europe and the Ryder Cup competition has never looked back. Even greater glory followed in 1987 when Europe had their first ever victory on American soil, beating a team captained by Jack Nicholas by 15 points to 13. Jacqueline's final match was again at the Belfry where the sides tied 14 points all and so Europe retained the cup. And we shouldn't forget Jacqueline's success as a player on the Ryder Cup. At a time when the US team was at its most dominant, he had an impressive record of 13 wins, 14 losses and 8 halves. And although his famous half with Nicholas is rightly remembered, he also beat Jack 4-3 and three in the morning singles on the same day. It wasn't all glory for Jacqueline, however. In 2013, he was the first competitor to be eliminated in BBC Strictly Come Dancing. Sorry, Tony, that was a bit of a cheap shot, but I suppose you're not ever likely to watch this video. Anyway, I think we'll end this very short look at Jacqueline's career with a recent quotation that I think many classic golf enthusiasts would agree with. Right, it's time to see how the clubs perform. And as usual, here are the lofts for the clubs. 
The irons are fairly typical for the time, apart from the pitching wedge, which has got quite an elevated loft of 54 degrees. Today's on-course play is a bit of a succession of minor disasters, starting with the first hole I planned to record, where I set the tripod up and it promptly fell over. I repositioned it and went to turn the video on, or so I thought, but it was still running, so I turned the video off. I abandoned this hold and moved on to the next one. Play was pretty slow and I was having to wait about quite a bit. But there's no excuse for the semi shank that followed here. I'd also forgotten my GPS watch so I'm unable to give any distances for the shots played. I did find the ball but then had to wait even longer to play the next shot and so gave up and moved on to a different hole completely. And so this is the first of the three holes that I'm playing today. Well, I haven't got a clue how far away I am. I'm all over the shop tonight. I'm just going to hit seven iron, which I know won't get me there. Well, though, I'd be better than I thought. Didn't tell you the green, I'm going to try and cheat this. Pretty good for me. And that was a bogey. Look at that, a foot behind the ball. I forgot to press record after my dismal drive and so this is where I ended up after my second shot. Well, again I forgot to press record. I'm not sure how far I've got left. I just want to go home and get me tea really. I'm going to hit a 9 iron. A long way short. I'm going to try a little floaty sand iron. Let's see what we can do with the rapier then. Terrible three put. I think that's a double bogey. Playing into the wind. 
four iron, but I've got a feeling a four iron's not enough. Probably was enough, but I was just 30 yards right. So yeah, about pin high. There's a chance for me to demonstrate another little floaty sand iron. Good for me. And that's a bogey. Time to go before this rain comes down. To summarise the play then. Bogey, triple bogey, bogey. It was another case of rushing about, trying to keep out of the way of other players and also to get in before the heavy rain really started. I must try to make more time to play the shots properly in future videos. One thing I am thinking of doing is adding a classic golf tip at the end of the videos. If you think this would be of interest, please say so in the comments below.